So with all of the construction complete, we can move into some finishing. And I'll be pre-finishing the headboard and footboard before I actually glue up and glue the post to the walnut. Anytime you have the opportunity to finish something before final assembly when things are nice and flat, a lot more manageable, definitely a great way to go. It's so much easier to finish things before they're fully assembled and have all these inside corners and stuff you have to deal with. So I'm gonna get this thing taken apart and then we'll talk a little bit about surface prep. So proper surface prep is the single most important part about finishing. No matter how good of a finish you apply, if you apply it over a surface that's not prepared correctly, it's gonna look like junk. So I know a lot of people try and rush through this step, but this is the one time where attention to detail and spending a little bit of time um, at it just to make sure everything is perfect and ready to go is definitely worth it. Today I'm gonna be using mostly uh, sander to do, to do the uh, finish prep, but if you have a card scraper, you can use one of these. That's going to save you a lot of time too. So the biggest thing about surface prep and sanding and all that is deciding or determining where to start, what grit to start at. So again, if you're using the card scraper, you can use this as your low grit essentially and clean up all of the rough stuff in one go with this. Now for me today, uh, my planer knives were a little dull. So like on the walnut and on the maple, there is some like, I guess, crushed fibers or micro tear out on the walnut. The curly maple does have some tear out that to remove, so I know I'm going to be removing a decent amount of material to get started. So because of that, I'll be starting today at 60 grit and working from there. Now that's a very important decision to make because your first grit you start with is sanding. That grit's the only grit you ever want that's going to actually remove material. Your, your, your intention there is to use that sander to remove material. Every grit after your starting grit is only there to refine the surface and to remove the scratch pattern from the previous grit. So as I'm using the 60 grit, I'm gonna really give everything a really good inspection as I'm working to make sure I get everything removed that I need to. Now on the posts, I just left these right off the bandsaw, so I know I'm gonna have to refine these uh, the saw marks a little bit too. So 60 grit on the legs will help for that. And of course, all the tear up that I have on the legs as well as to be removed. So the whole overarching theme here with sanding is your first grit, you're gonna spend the most time at that grit. You're gonna spend a lot of time actually sanding the surface. All the other grits, they go by pretty quickly because all you have to do is just go over the whole surface with the sander. You're trying to cover the surface with the sander and evenly scratch that surface to remove the deeper scratches from the lower grit. So, so far I've gone from 60, 60 to 80 to 120 and I'm about to go to 180. And at this point after 120, the surface should be nice and smooth. 120 is pretty good for like the scratch pattern. It is very hard to see a 120 scratch pattern, but it is kind of in there, it's kind of murky, but you should not see any visible scratches or swirls at this point. So between the grits, I like to hit the surface with some compressed air. This is gonna knock off the dust and any bits of uh, the grit from the previous sanding. And that'll keep those little bits of grit, if there are any on the surface, from being trapped between the wood and the new sandpaper and making more scratches on the surface, at least in theory. So now that the surface is all sanded, I'm gonna work on getting these edges all ready to go. And down here, I just blunted the corners with the sander. I'm gonna finish it off with some sandpaper. I have some 150 grit, and then I'll finish that off with 180, and then also break these edges here. Now I don't want to go up too high because the posts end here and I want the intersection of the walnut and the maple post to be nice and square. So I'm just going to feather it into here and just kind of feather into that, um, this blunting area here. And since this end grain is going to be exposed on the project, I want to clean it up pretty nice. Uh, this is a hand plane surface, but it is a little rough here, so I'm just going to hit it with some 220 just to kind of smooth it out. There's a little bit of, there's maybe a small track mark here, but overall the cut from the hand plane was just a little bit on the rough side. And I also have to finish up the edge here. This is only sand to uh, 120, so I'm just going to go over the bark section here again, and now that the faces are done, I can blend the corners into the faces. 
Now this might be the most important step in the whole process and that is checking your work and getting a preview of what this is going to look like when you put finish on it. Uh, at this point I'm going to wipe this whole thing down with mineral spirits and that is going to do two things for me. For one it's going to clean off a little bit of the dust here. Um, I'm actually going to leave some dust on the surface. Um, this is walnut and it's porous so a little bit of the sawdust will stay on the surface for that first coat. And that'll help fill the pores a little bit. This is a little thing I do with walnut. And the other thing it's going to do is that finishes bring out imperfections. Any imperfections in the surface you'll, you'll be able to see instantly with finish on there. So wouldn't it be nice if you could see what it's going to look like before actually applying finish. <laughs> well that's exactly what this step will do. So the mineral spirits will go on there and that will reveal exactly what this is going to look like when I apply my finish. Now I'm using mineral spirits because I'm going to be using an oil based finish and it's thinned with mineral spirits. If you're using like shellac for instance you can do the same thing with denatured alcohol without any issues. Like I could apply finish to this right as it is right now. So as I'm applying this on here it actually looks pretty pretty darn good. I don't see any scratches or major imperfections that I missed. So one thing I want to point out is this bit of tear out here. This is actually a really deep area of chip out from the planer as those knives came across that undulating grain there. It tore a giant piece of wood out. Now to fix this I have to dish out this area, basically bring the surface level down over an eighth of an inch and then feather all that area back to make that low spot not noticeable. Now I decided to just leave this as is because this is actually below the level of the mattress so you're never really going to be able to see this. But I can tell you what, I am pretty excited to get some finish on here because this is pretty ridiculously good looking here. I'm going to get in close, kind of change my angles a lot as I'm looking at the surface, trying to get some raking light coming in down off the, um, I have some lamps above the, the workbench here and they'll provide a little bit of a raking light if I can get the angle just right with my head. So that's what the surface looks like right now. Honestly, I can't see any scratches, any dents, any imperfections. That is, that's looking pretty good. So I'll do the same check on the other side, and then this one will be ready for finish. All right, here's this side. My mineral spirits is flashing off already. But uh, yeah, this one's also looking pretty darn good. So the posts have also been sanded all the way through 180 grit and now it's time for some of their finishing details. I'm going to put a chamfer on the bottom uh, edges of the posts and that's going to prevent the leg stock from splitting if this thing is dragged across the floor. This kind of eases this corner here. I'm also going to break all the edges, give it a really light round over a chamfer kind of thing. And the same thing on the top side, that'll get a little bit of a light chamfer as well. So one other detail on here is that some of these still have a little bit of bark on here. I think this one is, has the most. The other one is just a little bit. So I'm just going to blend away some of the, the bark here and hopefully I can get this looking kind of like the walnut in the headboard and footboard. And that mirrors something like that. That's kind of a cool look. It kind of matches the, uh, the walnut a little bit. So before I get ready to put finish on the rails, I still have to attach the blocks which are going to hold the bolts, which is going to hold the whole bed together. So down here on the, uh, the footboard side, I have uh, one bolt, and then on the headboard side, I'm just going to do two bolts because I have more uh, real estate down there. So this is, gonna, this is just going to get glued in place. I'm going to clamp a uh, little edge guide here to the tendon so that the shoulder is kind of, I don't know, in line up here. So that way I can butt this block up against here and glue it in place. And lastly, I'm going to stick a piece of paper between the, uh, the edge here and my block. And that's going to give a little bit of space there so that when the bolt gets tightened up, it's going to cause the shoulder on the front side of this tenon to fully seat before this block happens to bottom out against the post. So since this is kind of a goofy thing to finish with the, I guess the angles in here, I have this up on a couple of sticks. That's going to just keep it off the table a little bit. I'm starting on the least important side because I'll be flipping this over on top of the sticks, which is, this is the back side. 
So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the finishing process here. I do have a whole video about this whole process that I'm about to do. If you haven't seen it, I'll leave a link up there in the cards and in the description to that. So you can take a look at that one if you haven't seen it already. All right, so I did my typical application of finish onto all the bed parts. Uh, I did five coats of finish, and now I'm ready to start on some assembly. And one thing I thought I'd mention as I'm getting going here, just to give people a realistic expectation of like how much time I actually spent on finish prep, it took me a little over four hours. So that was me in here sanding, making sure all the surfaces were good to go, nice and smooth, and all, the, all that stuff, all the edges were broken end grain was sanded nicely and smooth, all that stuff, a little over four hours. And for me, I think that's pretty easy to justify. If you're going to be building a piece of work to this caliber, four hours to make sure that thing is, you know, perfect and is everything you want it to be is a small investment. Like when I finished the, um, the secretary desk, that was a solid two full days of finish prep but I also had a few hundred hours into it. So, you know, 16 to 20 hours of finish prep, you know, less than 5% of the overall time to build the piece, it seems like a very valid investment of time. That's uh, my thing about finish prep, I guess. So I'm gonna start getting the headboard assembled and that's going to be basically just a breadboard end assembly. So to kind of protect my finish here, and help me with my layout. I'm gonna put some um, blue tape onto the surface here and I'll lay out my lines, my hole locations on that tape. Now the exact placement of these holes this is gonna be super important. I'm just gonna get them eyeballed into center of the mortises. And then I'll just make a mark to indicate how far back they're gonna be and I'm gonna do Let's do three quarter. That seems like a good amount. So I can drill these holes at the drill press. I'm not going to go all the way through the leg with this. I'm going to do a half line painting so you'll only be able to see the pegs from one side of the leg. These legs are pretty, you know, they're pretty thick so it'll be pretty hard to drill. Well, I guess it wouldn't be that hard. But I could drill all the way through but it's really not necessary for this. And the next thing I'm going to do is mark the hole locations on the well, the whole location is from the mortises onto the tenons. And I'll use the same drill bit that I used to drill the holes. It's a brad point drill bit, so when I drop it down the hole, it'll put a center mark onto the tenons. So now I have the whole location marked on the tenon, and what I'm going to do is actually move my whole location towards the shoulder just a little bit. And what that's going to do is when I force a dowel through this joint, it's going to pull the tenon deeper into the mortise and make the shoulder line really tight. I'm also going to angle the drill at roughly the angle that the bed is splayed back because the dowel or the hole through the mortises is not going to be square to the face of this tenon. So here's where the magic of the breadboard end comes in. This panel is going to want to expand and contract as the humidity changes throughout the seasons and the way it's inserted into the post, that post isn't going to get any taller or shorter. So this panel needs to be able to float as it's attached there. And typically on a breadboard end, you would fix the center and you allow the outside two tenons to float, which I could do here. But what I'm going to do is actually fix the top and allow the bottom two tenons to float. So basically, I'm fixing this location here and these are going to move that way. So I can direct the wood movement into whatever direction I want. I can send it 
that way, or you can send it in both ways. You can send it up this way. Doesn't really matter which way you send it, as long as you make an allocation for it. What I'm going to be doing here is using a, a file to elongate these holes, basically turn them into slots, and that'll give the dowel that I drive through here a little bit of back to forth movement so that as this panel expands and contracts, the dowel can pass through the slot, or the slot can pass around the dowel, because the slot will be moving at the dowel. And that'll allow this thing to stay connected to the post because the dowel is still going to be applying pressure at the front side of this hole and at the same time allow this panel to float and not get bound up. Now I'm not going to need a really wide slot here. I'm only really going to allow for maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch at the most at the far end and that's going to be a little bit different from like a tabletop where you have a much wider panel which is going to experience a lot more movement. For something like that you probably want to go to at least a quarter inch um, on the very end tenon. Alright, so this finished up my last test fit. This looks pretty good. I made the dowels. I went with walnut for the stock for those. I was going to use maple uh, for low contrast, but I figure, you know, why not go for a little bit more contrast to keep kind of that contrasty flow thing going on. So I'm going to take this thing apart and we'll do some gluing. This is kind of a scary moment here. So I'm using epoxy again for this glue up. Uh, just for the working time, just in case I don't really want to have any surprises at this stage. So I'm only applying glue to the first tenon here and just a little bit of the stub, maybe a total of four inches or so of total glued area. I'll glue the underside too. Ooh. So the first dowel gets glued into the hole and I put a little bit of a point on the end of the dowels here. That's going to help it clear that little uh, stepped area as it passes through the tenon. And you can see how tightly that pulled the shoulder. And now I'm just going to keep um, hammering this down until I hear the pitch change and then I know it's bottomed out in the hole. So these ones just go in dry and then once they get down far enough I'll put a little glue on the top here. That way they get glued in the hole to the post itself and not to the tenon. That just keeps them from backing out of the hole. Yeah, look at that. Tight. So the glue is set up overnight and this is kind of the trade-off with uh, pre-finishing something like this with exposed joinery is that now I need to clean up these pegs and get them flushed up without damaging the finish that I already applied. So I'm going to go pretty carefully with a flush trim saw, trim away as much of the dowel as possible. The blue tape here is going to help protect the surface of the post as I saw through that and then I can clean up the rest of the material with a little bit of chisel work. And then lastly here I'll just hit it with some 600 grit sandpaper to clean up any a little bit of surface imperfection and then I'll just give it a light coat of finish just to even things out and to get some finish onto the end grain of these dowels. So now the last thing I have to do is to make the mattress support system and that is going to start with a ledger that's going to rest in this groove here that's in both of the rails. And to make that ledger I'm going to use this piece of ash here. This is a chunk of ash that my friend and I cut on his swing blade sawmill about two years ago. That was a, that was a fun video if you haven't seen that one before. <laughs> and then the mattress support itself, the slats are going to be made from a few extra pieces of flooring that I had made when I did the flooring project like a year and a half ago. So for the flooring here, I'll just rip the tongue groove off and then these will become the slats that will rest on the ledger, which will be attached to the rails of the bed.
So side rails are going to attach to the head and footboard with the socket head cap screws. So I'm going to transfer the hole locations from my blocks to the posts so I know where to drill the holes. Those holes are going to get drilled out and tapped for that socket head cap screw to thread into. Uh, doing it this way will allow me to have no visible hardware from the outside, but this is, can still be very easily disassembled to be moved around. To tap the holes, I'm using these thread taps that my friends Mark and Andy developed. They're longer than normal taps, which is going to be nice for this application so I can have even more threads in the post. And they also have a hex shank that can be easily grabbed with a drill. Now I have the pre-production version of these, but the new versions of these, the threads that the tap actually cuts are a little bit undersized. So the first time you put a bolt down the hole, the threads on the bolt will actually compress the fibers and kind of burnish them a bit, making them even stronger and having a really good grip on the threads. Now this is still gonna be plenty strong for what I'm doing here because I have so much, I'll have so much thread engagement, but these are pretty cool. So I'll leave a link to those down in the description. So I'm going to use a few core 20 bolts to hold the ledger to the rail. I'm going to tap the holes in the rails just like I did with the holes in the posts. And that's going to allow us to come on and off pretty easily as this bed needs to be disassembled since this ledger is going to be in the way of the bolt on the end there. So this ledger has to come off before the rails can come off. So I'm super happy with the way this thing turned out. If you follow along from the beginning, you know it's kind of evolved as I went and I really allowed the wood to kind of dictate a lot of the things on the piece. I really like the contrast between the walnut and the maple, but I especially love how the sapwood that I left in the walnut kind of flows into the maple and kind of gives a nice unifying element there. I also really like the subtle playfulness on symmetry and asymmetry in the bed. The headboard and the footboard are both book matched, so you have some symmetry there, but only the top edge has a live edge, so it's technically asymmetrical. I also really like the height of the posts. I think they're a really good height to give more focus to the walnut panels, and I think the overall curvature and the shape of the legs really kind of lends well to the natural curvature in the rest of the wood. So I'm also really excited because this is the first piece of furniture that I've made that incorporated a live edge. And I'm super excited by the results. I think this bed was a really great candidate for incorporating a live edge because it doesn't really detract from the overall look. It kind of blends in nicely and just has a really cool feel. And I really like that I left the live edge on the rails because I think that really gives a really unique look to the whole piece. Not to mention the crotch section down there that flows into the leg kind of like a brace. I'm really happy I did that as opposed to cutting that just straight and leaving it kind of a standard squared off looking rail. So that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed this series. I know I did. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the bed build or anything back in the shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking.